traffic maps. But All right, we're going to get started uh, in our last session for the day before we do Q&A with Gary is analytics for decision making in an increasingly uncertain environment. All right, the end is near, uh, and it's near enough that I, uh, uh, like you, want to enjoy the weather today. It's a great fall day, uh, so uh, I'm probably uh, going to do myself a favor and all of you uh, and curtail or eliminate, or co let's call it combine, any Q&A for me with the panel. So uh, when I get off, you can get off. <laughs> So it'll be brief. Uh, and I, for those who don't know uh, or recall, we do have a, a short hike. It's an easy one mile hike. We'll go up uh, about three or four miles from town, gain some elevation, go to the top of what's called Bald Mountain, and uh, take some photos, see some snow capped peaks, and come down and uh, get margaritas at the Rio. Uh, so uh, if we just can meet in front. Uh, for a casual hike, uh, it says sooner, hopefully 5 o'clock, because the sun sets early. Uh, but 5.15 is the official departure time. Uh, so this is the closing panel. And we put a lot of thought into this last panel in terms of what are we going to close out with uh, on the conference. and. Um, I think the company, uh, Ascend, has always looked at risk-based decision analysis and uncertainty. And that's kind of been a theme uh, of this event, no doubt, uh, is how do we deal with uncertainty. It's a fundamental component of decision making. And as we have not only uncertainty in the load side and the market side uh, is increasing, but also on the physical side now is supply. Um, and I think different entities deal with this in different ways. And we want to um, talk about this uh, with our, our panel here. So first let me introduce this panel. Um, and uh, we'll start right next to me is Tyler Castile. He's a data scientist with Veridity. And he's looking at uh, all sorts of, uh, let's say, interesting nuances with power market dynamics and behavior for optimizing generation, particularly uh, around uh, flexible generation storage. Uh, a fun fact about uh, Tyler is uh, he used to teach salsa classes in Denver here uh, in his free time. Uh, that's impressive. Um, uh, Usi here uh, to his left uh, is the leader of market development and marketing for Vatsila Energy Solutions. Um, it's a they make the big internal combustion engines, Wartzilla. Usi uh, has developed several new businesses uh, throughout the years at Wartzilla and uh, has been very involved in making Wartzilla engines uh, a capacity resource that's flexible to address uh, the new needs of power markets today. Uh, he holds an MS in ener energy and power plant technology. Uh, in terms of his uh, personal life, he's an exemplar example of uh, having already experienced full-scale climate change, having moved from uh, Finland to uh, Houston. <laughs> I've seen that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, it will not be that severe. <laughs> but that's very funny. Um, Michael Anger is an energy market manager at uh, Austin Energy, uh, to the left of USI. And uh, Michael, and you heard his colleague uh, Erica speak yesterday. Uh, Michael's more hands-on in running uh, the wholesale market risk management activities at Austin and identifying opportunities and hedges. I think uh, Erica mentioned maybe a hedge of yours yesterday, uh, which, which, which you can respond to sure, a little bit. Sure. <laughs> 
and uh, more importantly, he's uh, kind of kept the ratepayers protected throughout the years at Austin, managing their portfolio in an extremely volatile market. Uh, Austin's done incredibly well of uh, maintaining consistent rates through time, and uh, Michael's and his team um, for public power just do an amazing job and, and commitment towards that. Uh, he holds a BS uh, in ec economics from A&M, and I know is a real A&M fan. <laughs> right. All right. Um, I think we, we have uh, three kind of TED Talk style presentations to uh, kick this off with. Uh, Michael, why don't we, we start with yours? Sure. All right. That works. Oh, I got the order backwards for you guys, huh? Yeah. We have a way to advance the slides or something? Oh, or? I think I can help with that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, happy to be here to speak to everybody today. Uh, I'm going I'm to try not to uh, double up on some of the stuff Erica said yesterday and probably talk a little bit more about uh, how we're managing some of these risks in ERCOT. I wanted to start off just with a few pictures here of the Karankwa wind farm. Uh, this is actually uh, the first wind farm we used a sense power sim to help evaluate. Um, it's getting ready to come online here uh, probably early December. Um, and what I really like about this wind farm, not just the, the pr generation profile, but if you look at that bottom right hand corner picture, you'll see that there's a lot of cotton there. And uh, this is actually a, a wind farm where the farmers are still able to just farm the land as well. Uh, we talk a lot about renewable energy. Not a lot of people talk about how much land it takes to, uh, to have a 200 megawatt wind farm or a 250 megawatt solar farm. So it's, it's, a, it's a neat way to see uh, technology and nature kind of working together. Uh, just a little bit about Austin Energy. Um, go through this fairly quickly. Uh, we are locally owned and operated since 1895. We are a department of the city. Um, we, uh, our dividend, if you will, is a, a general fund transfer to the city. Uh, the floor is $105 million. It can be certainly higher than that. Uh, we're the seventh largest uh, public power utility based on electric uh, customers. Um, that's probably a 2018 number. Um, so we have some pretty uh, aggressive goals, I would say. Um, renewable goals, uh, as well as efficiency goals. Uh, we are looking to be 55% renewable by 2025. Uh, we're going to be 65% renewable by 2027. Uh, we're actually in the process of going through a resource plan uh, right now, a little bit of a refresh. And I will not be surprised if uh, th the next time we all meet up, uh, there'll be a much bigger number there that we'll try to be achieving by 2030. Uh, we're also looking to reduce our CO2 emissions from our power plants, 20% uh, below 2005 levels by 2020. We're already there. Um, we are big on energy efficiency. Um, so we have a goal of over 900 megawatts of energy efficiency and DR. Um, but we have to do all this and still stay affordable. So we have an affordability goal where our rates cannot go up more than 2% year over year. And we need to stay in the, the lower half of ERCOT uh, retail rates. Um, our city council is our board. Um, and uh, you know our community and our stakeholders really kind of help uh, form how we, we move forward. Our stakeholder process, we generally will have, when we do a resource planning, we will have people uh, that represent different areas of our community, low income, industrial, uh, environmental, religious organizations, and we get them all together and we work on the different scenarios that they want, you know, they all have different needs, uh, different desires, and we try to find something that works for everybody. Uh, by going through running models and simulations and showing the actual cost of what, they, what they're looking for. And that helps us uh, move through council a little bit easier. I think Erica showed this uh, yesterday. This is just where all our assets are currently located. Um, most of our renewable assets are done under PPA since we do not have uh, tax appetite, so we can take advantage of, of some of the PTC and ITC through PPA structures. Uh, but I do want you to kind of notice how spread out we are. We, we do that intentionally, so you'll see we have you know, assets all over Texas. Um, so we're in ERCOT. Uh, ERCOT is an energy only market, uh, no capacity. Uh, I think it's probably one of the most interesting markets in the world, probably one of the most volatile markets in the world. Uh, and it is in the middle of a, a rapid change right now. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, 
the generation supply stack is really changing. Um, and so we've become more and more dependent on forecasts. And, and ERCOT really punishes assets that are not flexible. So um, a lot of those base load units, uh, even if they're low cost units, are, are facing some, uh, some tough times ahead when you look at the forward curve. Uh, we had almost 5,000 megawatts of coal shut down in 2017. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that, this, that trend is going to continue. Um, so down at the bottom, I have uh, kind of what the supply stack looked like in 2013 and what it is looking like in 2019. Uh, this is uh, from Bloomberg. Um, but what I want you to notice is how quickly the renewable penetration is occurring. So back in 2013, uh, we didn't really have any solar. Uh, there was just one little solar farm. I actually think Austin Energy had about 30 megawatt solar farm. Uh, you know, maybe about 10 gigawatts of wind. Uh, you fast forward to 2019, and we're getting closer to almost 40 gigawatts of renewable energy in, in ERCOT. Um, quite a bit of solar is coming online. And if you look at the queue of what's going to get built in ERCOT, uh, it is 99% solar and wind. <laughs> Um, so I just have a few stats there to talk about how, as it's changed, and as we're more and more dependent on these intermittent resources, uh, we are seeing a, quite a bit more volatility. So we are seeing you know, more higher prices uh, than we were seeing before. We're also seeing a lot more lower prices as well. So we're, we're starting to see quite a few negative prices. And so this is actually, those stats are actually at the hub. So that's not an individual node. That's the whole hub going negative. And that's hub south, which is made up of, of 30 different 345 kV uh, substations. Um, so what makes $9,000 happen? So that did happen this past summer. It was uh, something people were worried about in 2018 uh, when we started off the summer very hot but did not materialize. So I know that first bullet probably kind of seems a little, a little simple there, but it, uh, you get to $9,000 when you don't have enough supply to reliably meet your demand. Um, and you know, how does that happen? So in the past, when we had more dispatchable units, you were only having to forecast load. So if the load forecast was off in ERCOT by two or 3,000 megawatts, that was something you could generally make up. Um, but now we have to forecast low. We have a west wind forecast. We have a south wind forecast. We have a coastal wind forecast. Right now, there's only one solar forecast. But as more solar is going to start getting built, not in west Texas, we'll start to have different regional solar forecasts. And so now, if your load is off by 3,000 megawatts um, in the wrong direction, from wind being off 2,000 megawatts in the wrong direction, and maybe solar off by 500 megawatts, you want a much bigger imbalance. And it's much more difficult. Uh, uh, for the system to, to, to meet that load. Um, and on top of that, uh, you know, we also have to deal with the forced outages. When you have a long, hot summer, units run very, very, very uh, at the top for long periods of time. And so when we get $9,000 prices, it's, it's not one of these things. It's most likely a combination of, of, of some of these factors and forecast errors. Um, you know, on the, the peak day that we had in ERCOT this year, we didn't have $9,000 prices. Uh, we had a day where we just missed the all-time peak by 200 megawatts, and the price on that day averaged $32. But we had another day when you know 96 seems hot, but it's not that hot in Texas, where we saw $9,000 prices. Uh, that particular day was, uh, uh, I believe, a wind forecast error on that one. It was significant. Uh, we had another day where we hit $9,000 because a big thunderstorm popped up over all the solar assets in West Texas, and there's not a lot of load in West Texas. Um, so we, we hit $9,000 that, that day as well. Uh, we had to utilize emergency response services twice in that week. They had not been used for five years prior to that. Uh, and typically, are used more in the winter. Um, and we had two EEA events as well. So I think Eric was, Eric was speaking yesterday that uh, when we first started our energy risk management program, we were really focused on natural gas risk. Uh, that was our big risk. Uh, the, the forward market was more correlated to natural gas back then. Natural gas was very volatile. But as we have started to retire units and move towards this 65% renewable, our, our real risk now is our renewable portfolio. And so we kind of chop it up into uh, five different blocks to figure out how we're going to deal with that risk. Uh, the very first is procurement risk. Uh, we also have to manage the price risk, congestion risk, volumetric risk, and then regulatory risk. So um, talking a little bit more about uh, procurement risk, uh, I don't know, some of you guys may have heard about the city of Georgetown in Texas, for example, where they went 100% renewable, and then two or three years later, they were having some rate issues. Um, you know, possibly part of that was doing it all at once, and maybe trying to time the market a little bit. We're a bit more methodical about it, so we kind of are doing maybe an augmented dollar cost averaging. And so as we have some contracts rolling off, we have new contracts coming on, and we're procuring those cheaper resources early. So early on, it was wind in Texas, but you can see we've moved more and more to solar. Uh, 
Also for procurement risk, um, we like to utilize the RFP process. I appreciate that some people earlier today don't like the vague RFPs. Uh, we do that intentionally. Uh, I think we get uh, better market transparency that way. In fact, we've gotten even more vague on our RFPs where we sometimes won't even tell you how much we're looking for. We're just, we're looking for something. Show us everything you got. Uh, that gives us a great insight into how different projects' prices are moving, uh, what's available. So this is our most recent RFP, but this is, I believe, the one we did with Karankawa. Uh, you can see that we had 80 unique solar projects proposed to us, 43 unique wind projects, uh, 27 unique uh, storage projects, and then 26 unique renewable um, plus storage projects. So we get to see quite a bit of information to analyze that helps us understand where the market's going, understand the trends. Um, and then we take that all through uh, an evaluation process. So we do economic analysis where we are going to utilize um, a fundamental model where we model all of ERCOT and run uh, scenario analysis. We're also going to use uh, PowerSim, do some stochastic modeling as well, uh, so we can better look at what the risk is around that asset. Um, we, like to, we like to try to find model alignment or agreement. So if, if the two systems aren't saying the same thing, we want to understand why. Uh, on top of that, we're going to do some qualitative analysis as well. Um, that may just be if I have a bunch of assets already on a 345 KV line, this might be a great asset too, but maybe I don't want to have all those assets concentrated in one area in case there's an issue with a transmission outage. Uh, we also want to see how it fits our portfolio. Uh, ERCOT's open access. Anybody can build and develop anywhere they would like. Uh, but we certainly don't want to do a PPA with an asset that is going to harm the economics of an existing PPA, for example. Uh, we also like to see how it uh, fits within our portfolio with their different generation output curves. So, you know, coupling coastal wind with solar, for example. And then we also want to look at the counterparty viability. It's a long process for us when you're going through that many projects. Our RFP process from start to uh, negotiated contract typically takes almost a year. And so we want to make sure after all that work that that developer is going to be able to show up and uh, make it on the PPA. When dealing with price risk, um, we have certain different tools we can do around that. Uh, you know, obviously evaluating a, a good project in the right location is, is uh, important. Uh, but you can also address some of that through contractual terms in your PPA. Uh, you know, getting rid of negative price risk, for example, uh, the way you might structure an offer curve. Uh, we do do term hedges and day ahead hedges around renewables as well. Um, you know, we look at the generation profile. So down there in the bottom right, I think you'll see where average prices are for August from a, a year or so ago. And you can see where that, where that particular asset is looking to catch more of those, those prices. So something that uh, has a little bit better generation profile. Uh, and then location, where you cite that has a, a big determination on, on what your price risk will look like. Uh, we deal a lot with congestion risk. Um, this gets back to lo location. Uh, you want to look for you know, future growth and supply and demand. Um, understanding what's in the queue for transmission upgrades, what's going to retire. Uh, and then we use a lot of uh, hedging tools and strategies around that as well. We, we utilize CRRs and ERCOT, congestion revenue rights. Uh, we do point to point. We like, prefer to do point to point options because uh, they're one direction. Uh, instead of obligations, the difficulty there is the point to point options really only trade in the auction. The auction creates kind of false scarcity because they're only going to auction off 10 to 15% of the system at a time. So if you get uh, too many risk adverse people and they miss out on that first auction, they tend to bid it up a little bit higher in the next auction. Uh, and so sometimes it's a little bit more expensive that way. Uh, but, but we do utilize quite a bit of point-to-point uh, -point obligations in the day ahead market when we have a little bit better idea of what the, what the forecast looks like. Um, we would like to see more of a bilateral market in CR so we could do things a little bit further out. Uh, that hasn't really developed yet in ERCOT. Um, and then I have storage kind of there with a question mark. Where I think we're getting very close to um, doing more utility scale storage. We have, we have a couple small batteries more on the distribution side that we're doing coupled with some solar uh, part, part research uh, to kind of see how that works. Uh, but I think we're getting very close to doing some utility scale storage. Um, I think I've been holding out hoping there will be a standalone ITC to improve the economics a little bit. Uh, when dealing with volumetric risk, uh, we try to address a lot of that through the contract as well. Um, you know, we're going to have minimum performance goals within our PPAs because uh, we, are, we are contracting these PPAs to meet renewable goals that our city council uh, would like us to meet. And we want to make sure that uh, we're going to have enough energy when we get to that 2027 to be at 65% renewable. Um, but at the same time, we also want to protect our customers from overproduction, pr uh, from overproduction as well. Uh, if, uh, if an asset overperforms, there may be some type of reduction in price for those additional megawatts to, to help keep us affordable. 
Um, we do have limited hedging instruments when it comes to volumetric risk. Uh, we are a muni, so we are not allowed to do weather derivatives. Um, and um, we can't really utilize RECs to meet our goal as well. Our stakeholders like additionality. They're, they're not interested in us procuring RECs. Um, and so also with the volumetric risk, you can, you can deal with that with the different technology and locations, having complementary, uh, complementing generation profiles and geographic diversity, which I showed earlier on that uh, map of Texas. Uh, when it gets to regulatory risk, that's one that you don't have a lot that you can manage. You just have to be part of the um, stakeholder process. You have to make sure that you're, you're lobbying with the legislature. Um, I think over on the right, I have uh, the ORDC, um, which is the Operating Reserve Demand Curve in ERCOT. That is a price adder when uh, physical capacity gets tight, where they put an adder on there to try to create higher prices to incentivize new generation to get built. Um, they put that in place originally in 2014. It wasn't doing enough. In 2018, they moved the curve out a little bit, which means it will hit earlier and higher prices. Uh, then they moved it out again in 2019, and they're looking to move it out again in, in 2020. And so that can certainly change uh, uh, your book a bit and, and your exposure and your risk. Because um, as you guys are probably well aware, uh, prices are not high when there's lots of wind on the system. So if uh, you have a heavy portfolio with, with wind, uh, you need to protect your load in other ways. Uh, ERCOT is a, is a, has a stakeholder process. So the market participants actually create all the rules. Uh, sometimes rules are handed down by the PUCT. PUCT, uh, Public Utility Commission of Texas. Uh, and we need to monitor those as well, and that will change how we procure. So one of the ones that we were worried about a little bit ago was uh, marginal transmission losses. We don't have marginal line losses in ERCOT, uh, but they were looking to implement those. So the further away from load you would be, you would be penalized in your, your nodal price. And if you remember that map from earlier, we had quite a bit of assets out in West Texas that so are pretty far away from load. So some of our newer uh, PPAs that we have uh, contracted are generally within about 30 miles of uh, large load centers. And then we have to deal with the state legislature as well. Um, so that's kind of how we address the different risks um, on a renewable procurement. Uh, Lucy, uh, if we could upload Marcella's uh, slides, that'd be great. Forward. Yeah, yeah, hello, can you hear? Okay, I'm Yussi. Uh, like uh, Gary said, I have really gone through a climate change. Just imagine moving from Finland to Houston. It is a really different climate there. And uh, I come from Wärtsilä. We are actually a company that is uh, providing flexible generation and storage for the market, so that is my, my background. I'm one of the sales guys here, so you know, that, that is the, there's the hidden motive always there. Uh, let's first look at, uh, I, I will try to give you a brief uh, look on how we, how we see the world, because we are everywhere in the world. We have sold power plants in more than 170 countries. So let's look what we see happening in the world, and you can then relate it back to Austin and, and, and Texas and so on. So, we can see these goals coming up everywhere now. These 100% these, uh, goals, they, they are s some states set them, some nations set them, some companies are setting them, even some retailers are, are setting them. India is setting amazing goals of building solar, and uh, Germany is going for 100% renewable. These goals are publicly acceptable, they are good for the mankind, and uh, they are kind of Politically easy because you will never be held accountable yourself about this. Uh, what happens in 2050? Uh, so right now we see a lot of uh, people who put these ambitious goals. Uh, we, we could call them visionaries, uh, saying that we shall have uh, decarbonized the system by so and so. Uh, but uh, really, uh, this is a complex thing to do. It is not a very simple thing. I think this example is showing how complex it was when somebody said, let's go to the moon, and uh, there were so many things that needed to happen, and if you look at our business, what will be the price learning curves of storage, uh, wind, solar, there are many things that need to happen that are beyond the control of individual companies who are looking at this. So I think there is, Gary, a huge opportunity for some science here. Uh, I think there is a global new 
huge business opportunity for the past 200 consulting. There are so many people that want to go there and don't know yet how to get there. It seems so simple, just keep adding renewables and you, you, you are doing right that uh, there, Michael, and uh, you, you add them and this is still relatively easy, easy because you buy more and you have more. But uh, I think the, the complex part is how, how you get rid of the fossil fuels in the system because most of the fossil fuel power system is quite inflexible. It's based on baseload plants, coal, uh, combined cycles, etc. They can flex to a certain extent along with the renewables, but when you start to go right in the graph, you start to get problems and issues and uh, how to get uh, down the share of fossil. I think that is the, the core of the problem in many ways, in, in many areas that, uh, like Germany has already produced 36% uh, of their electricity with renewables in 2017, but they could only use 21. So they pushed 16%, 15% uh, to Poland, to their neighbors, because their coal and nuclear fleet is not capable of flexing enough. The, here is a, we, we are doing in Vertila quite a lot of dispatch modeling. Uh, we do this for the reason of understanding the role of flexibility and understanding how these systems will evolve. We are not modeling the markets, uh, the electricity markets so much. We model the physical power systems. and. We have done more than 50 national power system expansion models for different countries and Chile is one of those and here you can see how the dispatch looks 2020 with quite a lot of solar. They have extremely favorable solar conditions in Chile. The yellow is the, the solar, you can see the daily, daily push down of the black coal where they have uh, some uh, river hydro in the bottom which is just producing flat block and then they have luckily quite a lot of reservoir hydro which they can use for balancing on the top. Let's go 10 years further. They cannot close down the coal by 2030. They still uh, uh, inaugurated some coal plants this spring. So there was a strong political push for coal still five, 10 years ago in, in Chile. But they will reduce it and they have put the coal now that by 2040 there should be not, no coal in the Chilean power system. But you can see the difference in the dispatch. Quite many coal plants have to be actually shut down already by 2030. And those that are online, they have to flex quite a lot. The purple is wind, yellow is solar, uh, solar again. Those little things that you can see down there, uh, those are the charging of batteries. And not on top, you have that light green part, which is then the dis discharge all over the night. But go to 2040, when coal is supposed to be off the system, you can see the strong overbuild of solar because you charge those batteries. You can see those charging curves down there. You charge them during a few hours, sunny hours, maybe between 10 and, and 3 or, or so. And then you discharge that light green there during the night. Uh, you, you discharge the batteries. So the coal is gone now. The river hydro keeps running. Uh, and uh, the run of river hydro does some of the balancing there. You can see the dark blue there. And there is that orange component, which is flexible gas, which Chile is now taking in their plants. They intend to build four gigawatts of flexible gas to kind of uh, operate mainly and only when the batteries start to be flat in the system, so you cannot uh, utilize them. So they are doing mainly weather management, those flexible assets. And. Uh, the fact is that even in Chile, they understand that gradually you have to uh, retire those inflexible assets from the system. This is about that reduction of the use of fossil fuels that I, I mentioned earlier. We in Vertila, we see this development and we have a corporate vision that we want to help the, to lead the world through this transition. So our vision is that we help the world to move towards these decarbonized power systems. And we do that by modeling, by understanding what will be needed, and then designing and providing what the path needs and what the final clean power system would, would need. And we are focusing very strongly on the flexibility part. So that is storage and flexible generation. So we, we are not in the wind power or, or, or solar power uh, business. Some lessons that we have learned, remember this is about system modeling, this is not about market modeling. We have done a lot of these models and we normally always do an expansion model first where we get the renewable quantities pretty much correct. 
and then we run some spot analysis of years, maybe every fifth year or so with short term modeling where we can then change the uh, type of flexible capacity and see what is the value of different features on the flexi flexibility side in, in money and in, in the capability to utilize the, the renewables fully. And we have seen that the first thing that is really important is that these thermal assets in the system where you add, keep adding renewables, they end up in a very different operation mode. They end up starting and stopping, they end up ramping up and down, and if you stop them, you need to wait a certain time before you can restart the plant, etc. So you have technical constraints in these thermal assets that you need to put in the model to get things right. And if you leave these out, you get easily 15% difference in the cost. And it, then the cost of generation for a year typically is too low. The real cost is clearly higher. I have made those two bold there, which are very important in this. It is the, the minimum stable load and the minimum downtime. Those affect the, the economies a lot. And then, the okay, this requires a big computer, of course. Uh, if you leave this out, the model runs much faster, of course, but uh, that is a fact just that you need to put them in. And the second thing is that was already touched here uh, uh, earlier is that not only to include the contingency reserve, which has always been there, but the forecast error for the renewables, uh, it, it, it grows along with the gigawatts that you put in. And if you have 50 gigawatts of wind and 40 of solar, like in Germany, you can have major deviations there. And those gigawatts you somehow have to have available if the wind comes down two hours earlier than was the forecast. So this reserve is huge and it has to be provided in the, and it has to be estimated in the model what is the cost of providing that. And like I said, the leaving this out uh, really brings increasingly false results. So we see in the world many utilities, uh, many regulators, etc., do the modeling the old way that these are not fully modeled. And uh, our task has been to kind, kind of help these people see that uh, you need to include these in the modeling. There is a star, I have made it personally, isn't it beautiful? Uh, this is the structure of the 100% renewable power system as we see it. There are four components or functionalities in it. The first one is that you have to produce the electricity. Then you have to balance the system at all times, millisecond to an hour. You have to shift electricity from, mainly from day to night and windy periods to non-windy periods. And you must have some dispatchable component that you can use when your batteries are empty. This is for the unusual weather management, you could say. Uh, if you look at the energy component, we see the big growth in wind and solar. Some people are lucky to have uh, hydro or have some other assets, uh, but these are not the global growth arena. And this corner produces the e energy and it, like, like we all know, it's weather dependent and it's non-dispatchable. So uh, this is not the dispatcher stream, this corner. And you have to strongly overbuild because the capacity factors are relatively low here. Then you have uh, the power storage, as we call it, for balancing. And this is what keeps the system stable. Uh, so the lamps don't flicker and the frequency is what it should be. And this is in fully automatic uh, dispatch, this corner. Then you have the energy storage, which is shifting mainly solar. Uh, because solar is so predictable, you don't need a very large storage to do this. Wind is much more difficult to, to shift because you can have windy periods for a week and non-windy for another week. So you will not overbuild wind so dramatically in real life. And this, uh, this corner has a flexible component which can then manage the unusual weather. So you have calm periods from wind. From solar you have winter in some areas. It's dark, I know one of those places. Uh, monsoon in India, uh, you can have rain for six, eight weeks when you ha don't have much solar and you have cloudy periods. And then, of course, if you have hydro, you have dry season. So this is more seasonal balancing. And this corner will, during the transition, use mainly natural gas. But in the future, it will transit to renewable fuels. And those fuels will be available in large quantities in this world because the demand is set by those targets that I showed in the first slide. 
If we look at now something that Gary and company did, I put numbers on this graph just from your Hawaii study, which is one of the very first ones I have seen, which is done in my mind very properly. It's, a, it's real looking at the dispatch, not only what capacities you would need. And if you look at how much is needed of these different components to cover an average load of a gigawatt in 2045 in Oahu Island, uh, there will be about as much wind power as the average load, there would be three gigawatts of solar. And this is, of course, strong overbuilt because th this would then charge the batteries for the night. And the storage component in the study is not divided between balancing and shifting. I just put here battery storage. And the size of the storage in the study is 7, 000, 7 gigawatt hours, which corresponds very well to the nighttime load, which is 12 hours, 600 megawatts, it's seven gigawatt hours. And uh, the flexible generation component is then sized so that even in the extreme weather phenomena, which I think was in the past six days of cloud cover and almost no wind, uh, what is the highest uh, momentaneous power need there, it was 950. So it's more or less the average load size of component. And uh, the capacity factor of this flexible component is, is about 8.8%. So it is not running a lot, but it is necessary to enable a much smaller storage. Uh, so you don't need to have a storage for those extreme weather conditions. Uh, and if you make the storage a little bigger, this flexible component gets a little smaller. There's a balance between these, and that balance is then an economic choice, that which one, uh, how, how large you should make each of those to, to get to the economic uh, optimal. And uh, the, the fact is that if you would cover that one week of uh, solar uh, cloud, clouds and uh, almost no winds, you, wind, you would need to multiply that storage size by more than 10. And you would need it once every three years or five years. So it doesn't make any sense to build a system where you don't have any dispatchable component to, to run when the batteries are empty. And in Hawaii, they are using biodiesel already today blending 50-50. Uh, I think in the future, they might have some other fuels available. There is a lot happening on the fuel frontier today. This is a beautiful graph, Gary, from your study. You can see the dotted line is the load, and this is a week. So you, you can see the daily and nightly, your daily peaks and nightly lows. And uh, the yellow solid curve is the sum of the wind and solar components. You can see that on Monday there, that, that curve goes much higher than the load. So the blue curve is then the charging of the battery during the daytime. And in the night, you can see that blue curve goes below zero, so you are discharging the battery. On Tuesday, you can see that the, the sun is obviously not shining so much. So you keep discharging the battery most of the time. And late on sun, uh, Tuesday evening uh, during the night, that black curve emerges there and the blue curve becomes flat. So the batteries are empty and this dispatchable generation component takes over uh, the system. It runs then the, the balancing, it does provide the reserves and it provides all the energy during the night. In the morning when the sun rises, the, uh, as soon as the combined wind and solar output is higher than the load, you start to charge the batteries, you instantly switch off. The, the flexible gas plant. So actually you are never charging the batteries with fuel. It seems that in the study, this uh, dispatchable component starts about one and a half, half, half times per week. I think this is, Gary, I give credit to your, your, you guys. This is really an eye opener, the whole study, how this system will need to work. This is really the economic optimum and to put so much batteries that you could cover even these black curves there, it would mean a lot. Finally, we have something here you can see on top of my pocket. We, have, uh, we are establishing a community of people globally who are interested to help the world go towards the 100% goal. So if anybody here is interested to join the community, you are welcome. We have people from many nations already in here and they all share the passion to to figure out how to go there. So this is something which we feel is very important and we try to do our share on this one. 
And uh, we will bring and success solutions and share thoughts and ideas between these frontline people who are thinking about this matter. And the typical profile is, I think, in this room today. M most of you would qualify for this uh, because this is people who are really thinking in depth of this analyzing and modeling, etc. And why would we do this? Like I said, our vision is to help the world move forward. And what we try to do is to unite these mem members, give them a chance of networking, and we will bring forward a lot of content and have a website for this thing. And we will arrange speaking opportunities for people that are, are interested to speak publicly about this. That's all for my part. All right. Thank you. That was great, Tyler. I think we're, we're going from the utility side to the, uh, let's say, supply side to the, uh, let's call it operational analytics a bit. Here. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Tyler Castile. I'm a data scientist at Veridity Energy. I want to go through today a little bit about our background of who we are. Uh, Veridity Energy and our parent company, Ormat. Uh, I want to talk about our data intelligence team, what we do, our data analytics, our data science backed research institution within our company. I want to talk a little bit about what is profitable market conditions for in front of the meter battery storage. Um, what does uncertainty look like within that? What decision making tools are we as a company leveraging? Um, and also look deeper into as we enter into an era of additional increased renewable penetration, what are the increasing analytical needs that we need. So who are we? Uh, Veridity Energy is an energy storage and demand response provider, a company based out of Philadelphia. We were established in 2009 and actually developed and, and started by former PJM executives from uh, PJM ISO. Uh, so we own and operate um, both energy storage and demand response assets. We have over 850 plus uh, megawatts of distributed energy resources that we operate. Um, we focus and operate our uh, battery storage in primarily PJM. That was the market that we first started in, but have increased our footprint to include now ERCOT in California and to include also ISO New England and NISO as well. So we have over 40 megawatts of in front of the meter battery storage in PJM at this point. We have an additional 20 plus um, in the development stage right now for ERCOT in California and also projects in ISO New England and prospective ones in uh, New York. So in 2017, Veridity Energy was purchased by Ormat. And Ormat is the market, uh, is a, a growing leader of geothermal renewable energy. They're actually based out of Israel and their headquarters in the Western United States is located in Reno, Nevada. Uh, so Ormat came to us uh, with over 50 years of experience in the geothermal space and really saw this as a strategic decision to see the complement of geothermal and storage. Uh, so Ormat has significant experience with over 900 plus megawatts of geothermal all across the world, uh, many of which these assets are also located in the Western United States. Uh, so working with Ormat over the past several years has been a great opportunity and we really have the goal of being one of the leading providers of renewable energy across the globe. So I just want to highlight a few of our energy storage cases, our in front of the meter projects in particular. Uh, so um, we have two assets in New Jersey, um, Plumstead and Stryker. Uh, these both participate in the PJM ISO and uh, participate mainly in, in market streams of frequency regulation, um, has the capability to provide capacity and, and reactive power as well. Um, so these have been in commercial operation since 2019, the beginning of this year. Uh, in ERCOT, so Georgetown was just mentioned earlier by, by Michael. Um, so we have a battery storage project located just outside of Georgetown, Texas. Uh, it's a 9.9, .9, 10 megawatt system here uh, that's going to be providing ancillary services and energy optimization or energy arbitrage as well. Uh, so it's under construction, um, actually ready to, to move forward, uh, waiting for the green light from ERCOT at this point. Uh, so this is a beautiful picture right here. I know we've seen beautiful wind turbines, had some great pictures there. Um, 
Some people may not think battery storage looks as great. I think it's awesome. Uh, it's a storage container, but really open these things up and you see the modules, you see the racks, and you see all the intricate, uh, the wiring, the components of the inverter and the transformer. It's a really piece, really interesting and fascinating piece of infrastructure, infrastructure that's really gonna play a critical role in the energy industry moving forward. Uh, we also have another front of the meter project um, coming online here, about two megawatts in ISO New England. Uh, so this is uh, a co-op uh, with a Vermont Electric Co-op. So it's an opportunity where we provide some peak load shaving, uh, different points during the year when they wish for us to provide this, and also engage in ancillary services in the I ISO New England market. So this is under construction and should be operational here soon in 2019. Also have several projects in the pipeline for, for California too. So we've got a 10 megawatt, four hour battery system in Vallecito, California. Um, this is going to be um, pro uh, providing RA to South Southern California Edison, and it's also gonna be providing uh, ancillary services and energy optimization or energy arbitrage as well. Uh, so this is under development and we're expecting COD around uh, 2020. So our data intelligence team um, is really a core team within our company that focuses on providing analytical value to all our functional departments across the company. Uh, so we engage uh, with engineering, we engage directly with operations who are actually uh, housing our network operations center and operating our assets in the um, ISO RTO markets. Uh, we engage with business development and we engage with finance as well. Uh, we really focus on these three key drivers. We're looking at driving growth, uh, by supp uh, supplementing our team with forecasting. Uh, so whether this is uh, five minute, 30 minutes hourly forecasting for our operations team for participation in ISO markets, or it's supporting business development too and looking at more long-term forecasts for uh, different market products. Uh, we also look into market optimization. So our battery systems take on a lot of increased uh, significant risk with merchant operations. Uh, we don't have contracted revenue for the most part, so it's all about how we effectively operate within the market. And instead of narrowly participating in one value stream, we, diver we diversify and participate in an array of as many value streams as possible that our battery storage can engage in. So we focus on that optimization um, in order for us to extract the most value. Uh, cutting costs. So we really apply a lot of descriptive analytics, too, that go into improving our operational process, uh, being able to assess where opportunity can be gained for our operations team and enhance market performance. Uh, looking and assessing downtime, what are the key drivers for downtime, uh, performing uh, correlation analysis between um, different key parameters in our battery storage systems to understand what is causing failures and what is causing this downtime and how we can address them. Uh, we also focus on managing risk. So we provide a lot of analytics around the warranty and degradation. So the key thing is for us to really uh, make our battery profitable and achieve maximum participation when price spikes occur, but we have to operate within certain physical uh, restraints. So batteries are extremely flexible resources uh, compared to say some of your other generators that we've talked, traditional generators, but we do have significant constraints as well. There is the state of charge limit, our battery capacity. There's also temperature conditions. Uh, there are different degradation components that we need to analyze and monitor um, and assess the cost, the opportunity cost of whether we go for the market opportunity and engage in the price spike, those $9,000 per megawatt hour price spikes we see in ERCOT over the summer, or we need to protect the warranty of our battery um, and assess that value. What is the quantity um, of, of the market opportunity and the degradation cost? So when we're looking at profitable market conditions for our battery storage systems, we love price spikes. And price spikes are uh, great opportunities for us, but there's also a lot of risk in it too. Our batteries engage in, in merchant revenue, and you could look at approximately maybe 10% of your revenue throughout the year can come from hitting one to two percent of these price spikes. Um, so uncertainty is, is not really an ideal state for us, but we do our best as a Linux team and applying data scientists to really wrap um, a little bit more probability and likelihood around when these price spikes are occurring. So we focus on predicting these price spikes um, and being able to assess risk and loss accordingly as well so we can hit those price spikes, but also understand what is the risk and what is the loss if we don't accomplish that. So we really focus on applying statistics. We apply statistics, pro probability, and confidence intervals to all of our numbers uh, to be able to support our operations team and also to support our business development team. Our real goal here is to, to operate with minimized risk and to, to capture this volatility um, in these ISOs, um, but also to protect the state of health to ensure our battery can last 10, 15 years. Um, there isn't a lot of data out there for large-scale and front-of-the-meter battery storage systems. Um, 
participating in these markets. So we need to be able to uh, ensure that we mit mitigate the risk of potentially um, running our battery into the ground before it was actually planned to do so. Uh, so below here I have a picture of, this is one of the models that we have, a uh, prototype model where we're focusing on developing day ahead dispatch schedules, where we focus on optimizing across all the different market products within the ISO, predicting when these price spikes actually occur, and creating a day ahead bid schedule for our operators to look at. Then they take that opportunity to assess um, and implement which bid um, in, they want to choose and select into the actual ISO framework. Uh, so from the, the top picture, you can see this is uh, where we're, we're forecasting where these price spikes are occurring. I'm sorry, the bottom, bottom picture. So you'll notice uh, the different yellow circles highlight the price spikes in the regulation market. And what we're doing here, uh, the red line represents the, the SOC. So we're ensuring before each of those different price spikes that are occurring, we have the maximum available battery capacity to participate in those price spikes, whether it be energy arbitrage, um, dispatching energy, or whether it's in regulation or any other market product. It's about ensuring that we can predict these price spikes. Um, and of course, we're not going to be able to be 100% accurate, but what is the probability? What is the likelihood? And then make a decision accordingly and ensuring that we're in the best position possible to operate our battery storage system to capture that revenue. So what tools, uh, the decision-making tools and the, the analytical framework that we, we leverage as a team, uh, we leverage a lot of typical data science tools. We, we, we use Python um, and assorted packages to really develop our prototypes and to model around all of this and to provide our tools to the rest of the company. Uh, we use a lot of statistics to quantify this uncertainty to help gauge and guide decisions for our operations team. And forecasting, forecasting has come up a lot and forecasting is absolutely paramount for us. Um, you know, for some of the short-term forecasting, we look at applying machine learning, artificial neural networks, um, and more of the long-term forecasting supporting business development, we're looking at different regressions and ARIMA models in order for us to forecast what ancillary prices may look like 10 years down the road. So analytical needs for high renewables. Um, growth of renewables, we're likely going to see an increased spike of, of volatility. Uh, so forecasts, forecasts, forecasts. And uh, when we look at the price spikes, Michael was discussing earlier uh, in ERCOT this summer, uh, a lot of the scarcity pricing, those, those hours occurred when there were forecast errors, uh, primarily this, this year with wind forecasts. So we really need to focus on improved forecasts for renewables. And if we're able to assess and we're able to capture forecast errors and produce better forecasts than the ISO is using, we can better understand when those price spikes will be occurring and we can ensure our battery is participating in the right markets. Um, mar right market product and at the right time in order to capture that volatility. So we really thrive on those $9,000 per hour um, pricing because that could leverage and, and constitute over 10% of our revenue uh, for the entire year. So it's absolutely critical for us to uh, understand these renewable forecasts and to engage in them. And there's really going to be more extensive risk management that goes in with increasing renewables too, particularly with battery storage. And uh, UC had mentioned that there's significant price learning curves that we'll be engaging in, particularly with battery storage and in these complex ISO RTO markets where you have not seen data where there's increased renewable penetration and increased active storage resources that are participating in these markets too. A lot of this is very new and there are new dynamics that are emerging, um, particularly with renewables and understanding and unpacking the black box that sometimes ISO and RTOs utilize for them to assess the amount and value of ancillaries they procure, when they make those changes as well, all those have severe implications on the pricing of the market products that we participate in. So it's extensive and important for us to really engage with ISO and RTOs to understand what they're thinking, how they're assessing, and how they're planning for renewables so we can get a better idea, understanding and idea of how we need to shape and institute our battery to effectively participate in those markets and uh, achieve that revenue that we're looking for. Right. That's it. Well, thanks. Uh, first, uh, I know it's gotten hot in here. I, I texted to get the room cooled off. They opened the doors to help. Uh, but it's prob probably a sign that we should wrap this up quickly so we can go on our hike and enjoy the weather that's making us hot in here. Uh, so I'll do my best. Uh, but. Uh, if you could uh, go to the slide from Michael Angler's presentation, I think it's his second or third slide that showed uh, the price spike negative and positive count. Uh, it looked like a, a histogram. Uh, and uh, this is just to set the stage, actually. No, I won't, uh, I guess the question, um, 
Let's see, we've, we've become familiar with you largely through uh, doing resource planning studies, and in Hawaii in particular, and you brought up that example. Um, Hawaii is the first state to go 100% renewable, and their plan failed twice, and eventually we got them through. Uh, when they turn to us to do the analysis. And one of the things they were missing, obviously, was simulating weather, which is kind of a key thing when you're going to 100% renewable and you're an island. Um, and it, it sounds kind of obvious, but uh, it certainly was a shortcoming. And they just had model limited choice. We were able to overcome that. But in doing so, we realized that there were conditions that were really extreme. And uh, I think your slide showed that, hey, there are times it's just cloudy, and no matter what, the battery's going to be drained, basically, and you can't charge it. So you have, occasionally you're going to have to turn on some other resource other than solar or wind in a battery. Well, in Hawaii's case, it's burning renewable fuel. And uh, I, I think we heard yesterday uh, a panel, uh, I think it was the third panel, the second panel of the day, uh, and utilities are saying, look, we have a need for a portfolio of assets, but we see conditions like Hawaii where things are going to be really extreme in terms of meteorology. Uh, and you know, we see here extreme in terms of price spikes as well. Uh, and you notice the amount of negatives, 31 negative intervals, uh, sorry, 154 negative intervals. And these are 15 minute intervals. And in California, we see roughly about 8% of the time that our uh, prices are negative right now, and it's going to be growing uh, yeah, significantly uh, through time. Storage, you, you're just not going to be able to solve this, particularly in the spring and the fall. Uh, which brings us to uh, renewable fuels. And uh, you're in Texas, Michael, and you know what it's like. It's just, there's a lot of wind and solar coming in the system. It's easy to see the future a decade from now or 15 years from now where there's surpluses. There's no avoiding the surpluses in the spring and the fall. What are we going to do with the energy? I mean, you can't store it in a battery. And uh, this is the Hawaii dilemma. What do we do with the energy? We, they have a lot of dump energy uh, at certain times of the year. And uh, so I wanted to pose the question to you. See, how do you see uh, your technologies taking advantage of dump energy, as I'll call it? Uh, it might not be curtailed. And what would you do with it? Yeah. Uh, maybe I can talk a little about these renewable fuels yeah. now and this subject, because the demand will be huge for these fuels. Just think about aviation. They need a liquid fuel. And we have to decarbonize the, the, the electricity part is only 25% of the total. total. So, and then take the ships. So a lot of ships moving around all the time. So what do we do with those? And long distance trucks, uh, it's hard to bring gas uh, on those. Uh, so I think the demand is there. And uh, when we look at this Hawaii and so on targets, they are all over the place. And uh, all the technologies to produce these fuels are there today. It is not technically new. They are more than 100 years old, these processes as such. But of course, uh, it gets quite expensive. So you first use electricity to split water to hydrogen and oxygen. And then you take CO2 from a source, be it a stack or the air, and you combine that with the, the hydrogen, and you have methane, and you have methanol, and am ammonia. And these, so these, uh, these fuels uh, will be available in the future. Shell announced in March this year that they will be the world's largest electricity producer. And they are not going to do that just to be as a utility and sell to people. They will use the electricity to produce these fuels. And uh, the forecast is that they will mainly produce methanol, which is nat natural gas. So you can use the existing infrastructure for that, LNG it and uh, transport and put in the pipes. And uh, then methane would be, uh, methanol would be the ne ne uh, liquid fuel, and methane would be the, uh, the gas fuel. And hydrogen probably not, because the infrastructure is not there. We would have to build a totally new infrastructure. You cannot put the hydrogen to the natural gas pipelines only. only. You can blend it a little. But so I think these will be there, and these will be the fuels like in Hawaii and, and so on, also for power generation in the future. They will cost, the forecast is that such fuels, today if you make hydrogen, it's four or five times more than natural gas, and methane is 10 times more. Uh, with volume and uh, so on, the, the cost should go to four or five times natural gas. So they will cost more, but like in our study, we saw that capacity factor 8.0, 
you don't use a lot of fuel. It can cost more. You, you just need to have it there because it's much more economic than to build that huge storage. So I think this is the, this is the situation. And uh, uh, the oil and gas industry is right now lobbying for regulation for this because nobody wants to buy a gas that is 10 times more expensive. So they are saying in Brussels and so on that let us blend 1%, 2%, 3%, 5% synthetic methane into the natural gas pipeline, so you allow us to invest in the processes and get it started. But we believe that firmly that these fuels will be made available, and then you just don't drill any hole in the ground anymore and bring more carbon on the ground. You are actually just recirculating the carbon that is already in the nature and in the climate, uh, not climate, but in the air and so on. So I don't know if this answered the question, but this really is an important thing that we see happening in the world. Many people are uh, researching this. The economics are not there, of course. If you have fossil fuel there and it's okay to burn it, this costs more. But over time, when we want to decarbonize, there will be ways to do it. So I think politically, this will be definitely on the agenda. So. Michael, you know, you're looking at aggressive, let's say, adjustments to your portfolio. I think, you know, 2027 uh, was 65% renewables, is that right? Yes, and we're already uh, under contract, we're already about 61%. Um, some of those projects haven't come online right. yet, so we're well on our way to get there. So, uh, and I remember you said you, you'll be adjusting it, likely it'll be higher. Yes. So let's call it, you know, probably 70 plus, realistically. Uh, and so that's certainly not inconsistent with where I think CCAs are in, in their <coughs> kind of portfolio supplies as well. It's really impressive. Uh, when you look at resources, and meaning needs, and you're an ISO, so you have a lot to draw on, uh, and you, you already have some gas, would you consider uh, building a new gas plant? Would you call it? Uh, what would you? I don't, I don't think there's that appetite in Austin yeah. right now to build a new gas plant. Yeah. Um, we're actually shutting down over 700 megawatts of uh, steam gas over the next two years. Sure. Uh, even though those assets made a whole lot of money this summer. So yeah. uh, regardless of the great performance, there's, they still want us to shut it down. We're shutting our coal plant by 2023. Um, and so we'll, we'll probably be mostly uh, renewable. We have a share of a nuclear unit that is probably going to have some economic issues here in four or five years. Um, and then we're going to try to hold on to our gas peaking units as long as, as we can. And that's where I was going, is the gas peaking units. As we hit you know, higher and higher opportunities for uh, higher and higher renewable penetration rates, there's opportunities to create synthetic gas. And maybe you know, it's probably not your business, but somebody out there is going to take advantage of this uh, uh, because we're going to have so much seasonal uh, surpluses. And if we're going 100% renewable, it's going to be probably, many studies have shown, impossible to build out the transmission infrastructure. Uh, to handle 100% renewable in the urban areas. It's just, it can't happen. Uh, and so this leads us towards renewable fuels. And, uh, you know, in political climates, it's burning something. Mm -hmm. It creates emissions. But in terms of climate change, and uh, you're in Austin, which is kind of sister city to Boulder, pretty liberal, uh, and you know, very conscious about their energy supply. It's, it's like food. They want it to be organic. Um, <laughs> same with their energy. And you know, I think we can both laugh at how extreme they get in their, uh, in, in their disposition towards clean energy or organic food. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering, do you think renewable fuels are something in the future? I think it would take uh, some education to our stakeholders to understand the renewable fuels yeah. and, and how it does affect the climate. Uh, and if that education was successful, then I think that was something we could look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we do have stakeholders today wanting us to shut down all our remaining gas as well. And so we're, you know, having to, having to balance that. So. Yeah, and I think the difference in you and Hawaii is Hawaii is islanded and they have no choice. They have to run on renewable fuels. And so it's just part of the process from the start. And I agree, it would be a bit of education. Maybe short comment here. The it will take time before this uh, synthetic methane and methanol are on, widely on the market. It will take years, yeah. maybe 10 years uh, or so. So the transition will need to go with natural gas. Uh, and after that, 
than when you are adding renewables and reducing the use of fossil fuels. At some point of time, you would then switch the fuel of the flexible assets to these uh, renewable fuels, and then you would be done. With the, this is how many studies go, and we have actually modeled already the cost of producing such fuels, because, uh, and it, that leads to that four or five times more than natural gas bracket. And uh, that, that will then be the final step to go to 100% clean power, that even your dispatchable flexible gas generation is using uh, renewable fuels. Well, in terms of uncertainty, you know, there's probably no greater uncertainty that all of us experience in the weather. And so Tyler, I was gonna kind of close this out with a question for you. Um, what do you see as the largest structural driver first of uh, real-time price spikes? Uh, structural from? Predictive in, uh, driver. Yeah, well, we're looking at forecast air between, uh, you know, what uh, load forecast air, um, either from wind or solar generation, looking at congestion, uh, looking at uh, planned or unplanned uh, transmission generation outages. Uh, so those key factors, those features are what we really look at to predict and determine when these price spikes could be occurring. Yeah. That's what we're seeing. I think everybody does who's, who's involved in this mm. is, is uh, seeing very much the same fundamental drivers. And how about uh, day ahead real time spreads? Uh, very much the same predictors? Um, yeah, so for the most part, we've been looking at real-time opportunities, too, uh, when we're looking at the market products that we've been participating in. Um, but I would assume that there's likely similar correlations with those same features. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, well, are there any questions for the panelists? Yeah, I've got a question for UC. So on your four-point um, star slide, you mentioned that there is going to require a strong overbuild of renewables. Um, when I hear that, to me, that implies a zero dollar, you know, market cost, variable market cost, right? Um, and so if it's a race to zero, if we have a strong overbill, that implies that most hours are going to be zero dollars. If that's the case, how are asset owners of solar and wind generation going to make a return on those assets? Um, and the second part to that question, I know you talk about the need for like five day storage. Maybe there needs to be a market redesign. So instead of having a single day ahead market, you have a three day or a five day ahead to create that demand now for that strong overbuild. Um, ironically, SPP is considering a three day ahead market, but that's for helping make coal dispatch more economic, which is kind of the opposite of what we're talking about here. Um, so I'm curious, are there any other day ahead market examples where it's more, maybe perhaps in Europe, I'm not really familiar with European market design, but I mean, in order to get there, do you think that you're going to need to redesign the market um, in light of your strong overbuild thesis? Actually, we, are, we have not really studied how the market should evolve in this. We are in this discussion all over the place, like I showed Chile and so on as well, but we have just tried to model how the system should look like to be able to provide 100% renewables. And of course, if, if the situation would be such that it's all renewables, and the price is zero, so who would ever build that system? So something has to change there. It cannot be based on the same logic that over those hours when you start all the thermal plants, you get high, high prices and so on. There has to be some other logic. I, I'm not the market specialist, so I, I'm sorry I cannot answer the question, but that I can answer that in Europe, this doesn't exist. This model, definitely. I would point out in ERCOT, they do have a day ahead market where you clear through ERCOT in a real time market, but you can trade out daily for the balance of the month. So you can go out and do weekly trades and, and daily trades if you wanted to. Really, the exact timeline is difficult to forecast because, because the start of this process depends very much on the political will. Like I said, these oil companies and gas companies are today lobbying strongly for regulating the start, giving us a chance to put a few percent of this uh, synthetic methane in the natural gas pipes. This is what they are proposing in Brussels today in order for them to invest to the process and get it started. How long all this will take, it is difficult to say, but the demand is huge 
to figure out those fuels that will be used in the future. We cannot just drill holes anymore in the ground and take the fuels from there. They have to be produced from the carbon that is already in the circulation. So it is my personal guess. We talk to Shell and these people, and uh, you get that feeling that this will take maybe 10 years so that these fuels are widely available. Then it's your own decision that you want to transit now or a little bit later. Uh, we see in our modeling, in the expansion modeling, that it's probably most economical to transit in that very late stage that was in the Hawaii analysis, that when you start to have the system in place, then the final switch is to change the fuel. And then you are at 100. Yeah. I think that's about 2045. Something like that. It yeah. depends on the place, of course. But those fuels will definitely be available in the 2030s in what, what quantity and what price that will remain to be seen. Other questions? All right. All right. Um, let's have one more round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much.